Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good to see everybody here. I appreciate everybody being here this morning. At this time, I'd like to call this meeting to order. Clark Barger, if you will, please call the roll. Master Combs? Master Barger? Here. Master Tudor? Here. Master Bunkin? Present. Just Tudor. Here. Uh, at this time, Master Barger, if you will, lead us in the prayer, please. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for giving us the ability to serve the people of our county. Father, we ask for your protection on the one that protects us. Pray these things in the precious name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you, Roger. Sheriff, if you will, lead us please. Everyone, please stand, face the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thanks, Sheriff. Guys, y'all had a chance to look over the minutes from the previous meeting. At this time, I need a motion second to approve. Motion to accept those meet, uh, minutes as written. Second. Thanks, guys. No discussion. Call the roll, please. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Just Taylor? Yes. Treasurer's report will be at our next meeting. Uh, first order of business, uh, I'd like to ask the court's permission to amend the agenda for an EMS block grant. This time, I need a motion a second to amend the agenda. So, second. No discussion. Call the roll. Master Bakken? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Just Taylor? Yes. Uh, at this time, I'll go ahead and do the... Uh, EMS block grant. Uh, this is a $10,000 grant that uh, Mass County EMS uh, and the county um, do every year together. We're actually just a pass through on this grant. Uh, this just got sent to me yesterday from Carlos, so that's why uh, I needed to amend the agenda. Um, and I would just ask for court's permission to allow me to sign uh, the block grant um, and send it in. So I need a motion and second if you approve. So approved. Second. No discussion. Call the roll, please. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Just Taylor? Yes. Uh, it's always an honor uh, this time of year to have uh, our school board, our superintendents, our assistant superintendents in the audience. Uh, got to know each one of them, uh, known some of them for a long time. Others got to know over the last uh, three years, and it's been an honor to work with each and every one of you. And we appreciate uh, your all's due diligence um, in providing education uh, to our next generation. So uh, applaud what you all do, your passions, um, and I really appreciate it. Uh, this this uh, month, every year, is the school board recognition month. Uh, and this is a proclamation um, honoring the members of the Mass County Board of Education uh, during school board recognition month, January 2018. Whereas our community values a quality education as a vital step along the pathway to success for our children. And whereas Beth Brock, Samantha Burford, Becky Cole, Sue McAfee, and Mary Renfro contribute greatly to this community through their service on the Mass County Board of Education. And whereas these decision makers are responsible for maintaining strong, effective budgetary oversight, high standards for employment, and a safe, well-managed set of school facilities. And whereas these board members are serving our community with integrity, honor, and a commitment to our children's future, and whereas January 2018 marks Kentucky's observation of their contributions through School Board Recognition Month, therefore I, Reagan Taylor, Judge Executive, do hereby proclaim the month of January 2018 throughout this community as School Board Recognition Month and urge all citizens to honor Beth Brock, Samantha Burford, Becky Cole, Sue McAfee, Mary Renfro for their service. So thank you all very much. Uh, and we do have Superintendent Thomas, Randy Neely, Assistant Superintendent, Board Member Samantha Burford, Board Member, or Chairman, I guess. Is that what your title is, Chairman? Yep. Uh, Beth Brock, and then S Assistant Superintendent David Gillum. So we appreciate y'all's service to our community. Yep. Thank you all. You don't want that. Just pass that down there to Judd, and they can they can grab it. Uh, next is update Madison County CSEP. Craig, glad you're here, buddy. It's been it's been a while. It has. Yeah, glad we've you're been, here. We've been busy, as you know. It's actually not a CSEP update. It's a chemical weapons disposal 
program update. So I'm not sure CSEP is a part of that, as everybody knows. But we appreciate the acronyms. She uh, here too, <laughs> you know. I thought you yeah. might. Yeah. All right, I might need a little help here on this. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so we're going to walk through this pretty quick. Uh, just to give you a sense of the perspective of how much has been done out there, this is a shot from the uh, <coughs> northwest corner overlooking the uh, facility in 2010. And this is what it looks like today. <coughs> and you can see that all of the all the all the construction and everything that's been done over the past several years, the uh, construction, and you can see all the buildings listed and so on and so forth. Those that don't have a handout in the audience, if you want one, there are some up here I can give you uh, after the presentation. So we're going to run through several things uh, today that are critical to the program and have occurred over the past uh, several months since I've briefed you before. Uh, supplemental funding, current status, employment, and so on. Just move through, I've had several people say, you're gonna be short, right? So I'll, I'll get like this and do it. Um, supplemental funding, in 2017, <clears throat> the program, which is not just Bluegrass, but it's Bluegrass and Pueblo, and the management back east and so on, uh, had a shortfall of funding. Uh, and due to unanticipated uh, 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 problems associated with various uh, issues within the program. The supplemental funding that was requested of $127 million at the end of 17 uh, was successfully uh, received and appropriated uh, with a lot of effort on behalf of our uh, congressional delegation, including uh, Senator McConnell, who's been there for us for decades on this project. Uh, and that money did uh, get appropriated into the program, $60 million of which uh, came to the Bluegrass Chemical Agent Pilot Plant. So we did get that funding, uh, and that was critical to moving forward. What the supplemental funding allowed us to do, now if you recall when the, uh, when it was realized that the funding was uh, not adequate to move forward as scheduled, uh, several things occurred. The explosive detonation technology, which is dedicated to the disposal of the mustard agents at the depot, uh, the effort on that project was stopped. Uh, we didn't have the funding to continue to uh, ramp up that project, and we took workers from that area and put them into the main plant to continue on schedule at the main plant. Uh, they had to lay off some people, they had to sh shorten the work hours and so on and so forth. Uh, now that the funding, the supplemental funding has arrived, people are back on that task and depending upon the execution of that effort uh, will depend on whether or not that explosive destruction technology facility can begin to operate prior to the main plant's operation for the nerve agents themselves. We don't know how that's going to fall out just yet, but it's encouraging to know that the possibility now exists to be back on track to have the mustard gone before the chemical nerve agents are even begun to be treated. If that's not the case, there's still the possibility that they may be co-processed, and that means that the EDT facility may operate at the same time as GB is being processed in the main plant. All of that is yet to be determined, but we're back on track, and that's the important thing. What the supplemental funding allowed us to do were those things that I just mentioned, in addition to what you see on your handout, I won't read it to you. Uh, the current status of the plant, construction is <coughs> complete, basically. There's a few little odds and ends that need to be done, but it's, it's over. Uh, I think it's important to realize that systemization, which is the integrate, the testing of each independent function within the plant and the integration of the various systems together to work as one facility once it's up and running, has come along quite nicely and they're at 54, probably a little bit more, 54 percent. And here's some of the issues, uh, some of the um, uh, components within the plant that are, have been systematized or are in the process of being systematized. Um, I asked Jeff just a few minutes ago about this next slide. 
uh, you can see it's rather busy. Uh, and I said, well, you know, what's the complete outline look like? And I think he said it was, I forget how many. Approximately 14,000 activities. 14,000 activities. So I asked him if he could put them all on one slide next time, <laughs> just to make it a little bit clearer for us. Uh, what you see here and the list of acronyms that I gave you relate to this particular slide. I'm not going to go through it now, simply to say that this is the site project manager's projection of where we are and where we're going to be. It's not an official schedule from the Department of Defense, but it is integrated with the Defense Acquisition Board's notional schedule, and this is the, what we're operating on at this moment. So it's kind of a snapshot in time, if you will, and there are several really critical dates uh, associated with this slide. Obviously, the big one that we're looking at, the two big ones are the beginning of processing of mustard in the explosive detonation technology facility and the start of, of nerve agent operations at the main plant. And then the other aspects of this chart have to do with the international treaty when they come on site, CSEP issues, permitting issues, so on and so forth. So it's a very comprehensive slide. I would urge you to take a look at it when you have the time and you have the acronym sheet associated with this so you know what it is you're looking at when you look at it. Um, Aqua and the military in general, for those of you that have served and understand, they love acronyms. So we have lots more acronyms than we have anything else probably. So we're uh, back on schedule. Uh, they're going to be rehired, they're going to be hiring additional people as we go through 18. Some of them will be tasked to continue working on the EDT, the explosive detonation technology. Others will be working on systemization. Uh, we had a tour of the plant not too long ago with uh, the Kentucky Farm Bureau and we have one coming up with the Governor's Commission and the Citizens Advisory Board, uh, I think next week, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and we will also be inviting you all again to come out sometime in the near future. As we get closer to agent operations, the number and opportunities for touring of the facility will diminish. Uh, once it goes hot, um, it's, they're not going to be a lot of tours, so don't bring the family. Um, so that's that. Acquisition to date, this is obviously very important to the community. How much money has been spent in Kentucky? how much money has been spent on payroll, and so on and so forth. As you can see, uh, is an enormous uh, economic impact, not only to Madison County, uh, but to the region because of this project. And I'll talk about economic development shortly. I think the local payroll to date of $893 million says a lot. Uh, <clears throat> and here <clears throat> we're looking out into the future on payroll and personnel. And as you might have guessed, uh, it's going to increase on up to the time we're in operations. And then it will diminish once operations are over and go down to zero once closure has been accomplished. Uh, these dates match up to the uh, schedule chart uh, that I just showed you previously with all the acronyms and so on in it. Uh, and this is what they're projected as far as the number of people that will be employed there and how much that payroll will equate to during that period. Uh, permitting issues, there's always the joy of permitting uh, associated with this project. There are several draft permits out right now that are in the public comment period. They've been noticed in the paper. They will be noticed again, I'm sure. Uh, there'll be public meetings on it and so on and so forth. I think the important thing for folks to realize, and particularly you all on the court, is that all of these permits are discussed with the advisory board working groups that are part of the uh, uh, organization that the, that, uh, the judge and I co-chair. Uh, it's a very diverse and representative group of people who sit on the advisory board. And within that advisory board, we have specific working groups that dig deeper into each particular issue, like changes in design, permitting modifications, and so on and so forth. All of these permit modifications and these draft permits have all been briefed, been discussed, been worked through in that uh, permitting working group and have gotten the approval and consensus within everyone involved that these are the things we need to do in order to move forward. So we have a very robust process 
to go through all these complicated matters, and we don't bring all 24 members of the uh, advisory board together to do that. We have five or six people that work on specific issues. Then we bring it back to the bigger body for approval. So these things <clears throat> can be and are very complicated. Uh, KDEP, the Kentucky Environmental uh, the, the, uh, Protection Department, um, has been very uh, cooperative and helpful with the citizenry to understand and give us an opportunity to be involved in all of these issues. So where we're we going? Uh, well, or before that, what are we going to do with this <coughs> facility once the weapons are disposed of? Uh, as you can see in your slide, anything that has agent touched it will be destroyed, will be raised. Uh, however, there'll still be an estimated infrastructure remaining with a value of about one and a half billion dollars. What are we going to do with that? How are we going to make an how is the Bluegrass Army Depot going to take advantage of that to increase their military mission? How can the community ensure that that's used to uh, continue uh, the tax revenue and so on? Everybody's focused on that. We're working on it. Um, we're working with the depot. And obviously, it remains to be seen what's going to happen with that. But we're not ignoring that fact, as they did at some of these other sites, where all of a sudden it was done, and they didn't have any plans in place. So uh, where are we going? Uh, the Energetics Batch Hydrolyzer and Energetics Neutralization System demonstrations are coming up. Uh, the Rocket Handling System demonstrations are coming up. GB Sampling Operations. Um, which I could get into that in, at great length, but I'm going to pass on it. Uh, just suffice to say that they will be sampling some real GB agent out of some projectiles at the, pl at the uh, storage area uh, in short order in order to make sure that the agent that's there can accurately calibrate the alarm systems within the plant. They don't want to bring in some surrogate or some GB from some other place. They want to get the stuff that's right here and sample it right here to make sure that <clears throat> what they're calibrating their alarm systems with is exactly what we have here. So it's a very wise decision. They're going to take it out of a couple of projectiles out there. And then as you see, as I mentioned a couple of times, the EDT facility uh, will be systematized and uh, air monitoring and utilities and so on and so forth. We're very excited that the EDT is back uh, in gear, so to speak, and that they're moving forward with that. Uh, we're, we were all very hopeful and continue now to be hopeful now that we got the supplemental funding uh, that we can go ahead and start the EDT operation prior to GV operations and get the mustard agents done in that facility. That is one of the primary units that could be used later after the chemical weapons are gone for the conventional weapons operation at the depot. So it has a significant amount of military value and I think will bode well for the future of the Bluegrass Army Depot to be staying here in Madison County. So that's it. I know it was longer than anyone wanted, but I'll take any questions. Um, Craig, in your uh, uh, layoff of personnel and rehiring of personnel, that was a probably a year time frame, maybe even a little more. Right. I don't remember exactly, but I'm thinking it was about a year time frame. Uh, were you able to get a good percentage of those folks that had already been trained back to uh, the facility? I'm going to have to defer that to the Aqua to, people since I don't do the hiring. Or did you have to rehire new people and retrain? Jeff, Jeff, if you don't mind, Jeff, if you don't mind, will you come up so anybody watching can hear? Oh, that's fine. Yeah. Um, Introduce yourself, yep. please. I'm Jeff Brubaker. I'm the uh, Aqua, that's Assembled Chemical Weapons Alternative Site Project Manager. Um, the hiring that's gearing up to take place starting uh, next month and which will proceed over about a 12 month period. Um, that is to hire the operations workforce. Uh, a number of the folks that were um, let go in the fall of 2016, they were more associated with startup or plant systemization. So it's, it's not the same, most likely not the same personnel. But in the upcoming hiring that will start next month, um, in total, approximately 450 uh, employees will be hired. Um, there will be some hired, obviously, from the local area. Some others will be uh, relocated um, into the area, and we will welcome them. Uh, and that 450 
includes about 300 people for main plant operations and about 150 for the EDT operations. So uh, it's a critical period that the project is going to enter into starting next month. And again, that hiring will span about a 12 month period. So I guess of the 300, then there will be uh, local training or offsite training for those? We have training uh, uh, and we have a um, training facility here uh, in Richmond uh, that will provide a source for some of the training. Other training will be hands-on actually inside the plant. Uh, every uh, employee that works in the plant has his or her uh, training and certification cards. Um, and then for each uh, area that they complete, uh, their management certifies them as a capable uh, operator. Um, some of the training programs uh, are on the four to 600 hour uh, range. Others are closer to 1,000 hours of training to uh, complete all the necessary certifications. So it is a very uh, robust program. It's one of the reasons, and time consuming, that's one of the reasons we need to start the hiring here over the next couple of months. Did I understand that the uh, nerve gas and the mustard gas plant are both up and operational? Um, the uh, nerve agent facility is 100% construction complete and as Craig briefed, 54% <coughs> complete with systemization. The mustard facility uh, will reach 100% construction complete this spring and then it will go into its systemization process. But it is a smaller and overall less complex facility so the main, than the main plant. So we're looking for substantial systemization completion of, of both facilities uh, sometime in 2019 and the uh, roadmap tool that was the uh, graphic that uh, Craig displayed with the acronyms um, shows all of that coming together in the uh, latter portion of 2019. But none of them are operational. Yeah, none of them are operational today. They're, they're, EDT is in the process of completing construction. The main plant is complete with construction and into systemization. Neither of them are operational at the moment. And as Jeff said, they both will come together and be operational around late 19, early 20. Did the lack of some of the welds out there that, that failed did that put you behind and, and some reason put you it, on a shortfall on it, the money? It did in the sense that that was one of several factors um, that resulted in the uh, funding shortfall as we entered the start of federal fiscal year 2017, which would have been in October of 2016. Um, but now, as Craig mentioned, with the uh, supplemental funding, the $60 million, uh, that has been placed on the uh, bluegrass facility contract. Everything that had been stopped has been restarted and is advancing forward. But as you know, all that has a time lag. Like right. Tom was pointing out, you can't, you know, you get, lay somebody off, they find something else to do. By the time you find somebody, you get them back and so on. So there, <clears throat> it has had an impact, but now we're back in full gear. So, we're, so we're, the start of the operation is probably 2019. 2019 or early 2020 is, is our target, the official program date. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you, Chief. The uh, slide for the permits, uh, Craig, the uh, rocket motor storage, holding them for another year, up to a year. Right. What's the purpose of that? <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> Those are non-contaminated rocket motors. So the rocket motors that are separated from the rockets themselves that have the agent in them, even though they're not contaminated with agent, they're still considered a hazardous waste. Normally, they are only allowed to be stored for 90 days under the hazardous waste storage permits. In order to accumulate enough of them to take them someplace to treat them, they wanted to extend that so they could accumulate more of them over a year's period and have more of those non-contaminated rockets to either ship to a place on the depot for ultimate disposal or to ship off-site. So it's more of a numerical convenience than it is anything else. <coughs> thank you. And Judge, I'd like to thank Reagan for his uh, diligence. I don't think he's missed a meeting. He may have missed one, and it was he was at some judge's conference in 
I don't know where, maybe Brussels or someplace. <laughs> but, Brussels. Uh, <laughs> no, Brussels. But I he's, doubt that. He's been there uh, at every meeting, and it's just been real, real good to have him there. And he's he's keeping up on everything that goes on. And so, I just yep. wanted to mention that. And appreciate, appreciate that. Yeah, appreciate well, that. One last question. Yes, sir. Uh, has it been determined where the final uh, disposal site after the, they've been denutralized for the rocket? For motors? the rocket? No, it has yeah. not. There, okay. it's a. There's several op options that are on the table. They're, be, they're under review right now, and that decision should be made, I'd say, within the next year. Sound about right, Jeff? Yeah, that's one of the issues that will be briefed to the, uh, the, the process working group over the next few months, and I would expect by summer, mid-summer or early fall, we should have a decision. Yeah. Just as a point of uh, information, Jeff just mentioned the process working group. Within the advisory board over the years, there have been all these different working groups, secondary waste, permitting, design changes, monitoring, so on and so forth. All of those are now combined into one working group called the process working group. And the reason that is is because as we approach operations, all those different pieces are going to come into play simultaneously. So rather than have you know, six meetings a month with different groups. We have one subgroup within the advisory board who's going to be dealing with all of these issues associated with ramping up towards operations. Because the dynamic has changed now. We're no longer looking at secondary waste in isolation. We're looking at it in the context of the operation of the plant. So we have seven people, I believe, from the advisory board who have volunteered to be on this process working group. Uh, that Doug Heinemann, the chair of the Governor's Commission, and myself will co-chair that process working group. Uh, and we have devised a mechanism to get consensus from the larger group without having to wait for the quarterly meetings. Because now we're on a kind of a fast track to get these things agreed to. So we will manage all the information and the discussion and approval within the smaller processing group and feed it back out to the larger group with recommendations, get their feedback, and pass it on up to Aqua. So we've streamlined the process because we're in a different phase now. We're, we're moving towards operations. I uh, uh, appreciate those comments there, uh, Craig. One of the things, our city cab meetings are quarterly, um, and so any of our electric that it was interested in ever seeing what's going on or just sitting in on one you're more welcome to come is that is that true sure mm -hmm. absolutely so um if if you are interested in ever attending one of our meetings um you're just let let me know i'll let you know when the date is yep so it's a good group good representation Thanks, 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 and uh, judge just one sure. other comment um craig mentioned an upcoming tour we actually have an opportunity next thursday Francette uh, has that information if any of the yep. board members. Yeah, they, they, we actually brought 10, so. we actually brought their uh, forms this morning for them to Excellent. fill out. Mm -hmm. Yep. So. Thank you. Thanks. Excellent. Appreciate y'all being here. Next, 2018 Madison County Clerk's budget. Clerk Barger. Yes, sir. Um, hope y'all had a chance to look over it. It's been in Dropbox for. Uh, about a week. Um, <clears throat> part of what I'll go over here real quickly is uh, this budget really doesn't tell you anything because it has to balance. Our expenditures have to meet our revenues. So I'll go a little deeper than that in the um, our office pays 25% off the top to most fees and commissions that we, that we collect. Uh, 2015, the 25% was $522,000. 2016 was 551, and 2017 was 553. So that's over this last term. That's 1.6 million that the, the office is paying back into the county quarterly. And then uh, news that I'm really happy to share and really give a pat on the back to all my coworkers at the clerk's office. We have uh, first term last year we in excess fees gave back the county three hundred eighty seven thousand dollars and as of uh there's some forecasts so it may be a little bit off but um because we don't have december wrapped up yet but at the end of uh, 2017 that excess fee money is five hundred forty one thousand dollars and i asked them <coughs> because of that increase in 
ver a three year versus a four year and that being that much higher, we looked over it twice to make sure that we're I'm giving you accurate numbers. Uh, I knew that we had, uh, we've done, we've, we've invested in technology, we've invested in equipment, we have uh, invested in training, and we've also um, lowered our head count a little bit, and that's where that difference is. Uh, that's, and we're gonna continue to try to get leaner and leaner and leaner as we go. So I, I anticipate that number um, just to continue to go up every, every year. What would you say that number was, Kenny? Five forty-one six eighty-three. Five hundred forty-one thousand six hundred eighty-three dollars is what that's what we are at the end of December, which is a large increase. So I mean, we should be we're, we're, we'll be approaching the three-quarter million dollar mark. Kenny, I saw in your budget there's a hundred fifty thousand dollar renovation project. Can you explain? Fifteen thousand. Is it fifteen thousand? Yeah. And it won't be in build. That's the thing it's going to bring up. The uh, another investment we'll be doing this year will be the move across the street, and we'll have to do naturally more renovation than what the county offices have because we have such a different okay. business model. We have such a front counter business. Um, we put fifteen thousand in there to get started with with have an architect come in to really get the drawings and lay things out because. We don't want to do this wrong because I don't. You know, we won't be redoing it, and I don't anticipate we'll be moving anytime soon. So we want to get this right. We want to set it up so that the, we can handle the flow of customers um, as the county grows, and we also want it to be as, our our goal is to be the most cost efficient, customer focused office in the state of Kentucky. Um, so that means we're going to do more with less, and we're going to offer more services and easier access as we as we go forward with this move. But yeah, we'll, uh, I'll be coming back to amend this. There was no reason to put a number in there because it would be a complete and total guess. So we, we put the 15,000 in there to get started, try to get some drawings, and then we can start to build you know, what, what actual remodel is gonna cost from there. I'm sorry, I overlooked that number. I thought oh, that's all right. Extra, no, extra zero. No, and, no, no if, it, if it was 150, I'd plan on being. You didn't, it says 150. Okay, it should, it should be 15. It's line, I'm a number 59. I was reading that correctly. Okay, you're right. Well, I hope you stay under that 150,000. I hope you do. <laughs> Good work over there. That yeah, makes me feel that, better. I, I'm not blind now. So. Yeah. <laughs> no, um, the, when we did the remodel down here in Berea, it was surprising what, what the costs were um, for labor materials. And, and we're going to try to do as much in house as possible to try to save as much as we can. But this, this move will allow us to set the office up in a way, right now it's just set up because that's the way it's always been, that's the space that we have. This will allow us to um, do more cross-training, do more combining of rooms, and do more with less folks in the long run. And uh, that's something I really have to get ready for because in the next four or five years, I've got about five people that are looking to retire. So what we need to do now is get ready for when they're ready to retire, that we don't need to replace them. This also puts you way closer to a one-stop shop. Than oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. For the for the citizen, it's it's. If you need to do any business with the county, you go to one building. Mm -hmm. It's good. Yep. All right. Thanks for clarifying that for us. Sure. 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 Sorry, I had it wrong. So w with that, <laughs> Kenny, do we need to we approve your budget? Yep. So do we need to prove it with that change or? No, I'd like to say there's no reason to approve anything. Because we don't know what's going Yeah. Okay. And if it comes back lower, I'll come back and we'll lower that number and, and readjust. But a lot of times, like I say, these two numbers on the front sheet must match. Yeah. Um, it's the opposite. It's government. I understand <laughs> it's the opposite of way anything I've ever done before where, you know, it, if you brought in revenues that were over your expenditures, you, sh you reflected that in the budget. But we're not... You know, that's not how DLG wants it. That's not how we do it. That's why I brought this other information to you. That's good. Make a motion that we approve the budget as presented. Second. Is there any more discussion? If not, call the roll, please. Hang on. I've got, I've got my papers crossed up. Got my that's all right. We'll wait on you. All right. Roger, and who was the second? Tom. 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 All right. Master Barter? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bacon? Yes. Judge Taylor? Yes. Thank you all.
Thank you, Kenny. Appreciate your due diligence. Um, next is Mass King Rescue Squad Agreement. Uh, to ask the court's permission uh, to allow me to sign this agreement between uh, Massey County Fiscal Court uh, and the Massey County Rescue Squad. Uh, it basically just lays out the responsibility of the rescue squad, uh, responsibility of the county, um, what uh, different services that the uh, rescue squad can uh, provide. Uh, it also talks about the uh, 800 megahertz radio system through our EMA department. Uh, it talks about them being able to help our EMA to uh, Mercy Management Agency in in the need of uh, traffic control of of spills of what whatever that, that they might need them for uh, also so I need a motion a second to give me the authority to sign this agreement with the Mass County Rescue and this actually goes into effect for the next calendar year uh, and it does have a 30 day uh, uh, cancellation uh, if we seem Judge necessary. I move we give you the authority to sign the agreement with the rescue squad do I have a second? All right, got a second. Any, any discussion? If not, call the roll, please. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Buckin? Yes. Master Barter? Yes. Just over. Yes. Uh, next is first reading of Ordinance 1801. Uh, it's a budget amendment for Kindred Lane Bridge. Glenna, good morning. Good morning. Yes, um, Kindred Lane Bridge we didn't have in the original budget, so. We do get money from the state on that, so we just need the budget amended in to uh, that line item. It's going to come into Bridge Street reimbursement, $50,670, and go into the appropriation line item of Kindred Lane Bridge Project. Yeah, and this was that 80-20 bridge money that we mm -hmm. applied for and received, yeah. So I need a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 1801, first reading for budget amendment, Kindred Lane Bridge. So moved. <laughs> no discussion. Call the roll. Master Bakken? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Judge Tucker? Yes. Uh, next is first reading of Ordinance 1802. It's a budget amendment. This is on the financing of the fire trucks. Uh, we finished the financing and got that closed with PNC Bank. Um, and the proceeds have come in from that. Uh, we need to budget amend it into CACO lease proceeds and put it into the appropriation line on fire capital projects vehicle. And we have already paid for that vehicle. We used reserve money to put into that line item. Now that we put this money back in there, we'll remove that back to mm -hmm. Good. What's the time limit on that uh, bond? It is five years. And no, it's, it's 10 years. It's 10 years, and it's it's not a bond. It's actually a, it's a lease. Okay. It's a lease, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Which, it, it's a governmental lease, which works pretty much just like a loan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. You know what rate of interest we have? Uh, 3.12. Okay. That's good. So I need a motion and a second to approve Ordinance 1802's first reading of the budget amendment for the finance fire trucks. Someone. For finance. Finance fire trucks. For the fire trucks. <laughs> <laughs> to finance. Yes. <laughs> motion to approve Ordinance 1802 budget amendment for finance fire trucks. Second I can. We'll advertise these to have second reading next, next quarter. Yep. Good. Thanks, Glenn. Appreciate it. Um, call the roll, please. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? <coughs> yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Just over. Yes. Uh, next is road department. There's some uh, to approve county maintenance of some additional roads. Good morning, Scott. Good morning. How are you, right. sir? Good, buddy. Glad you're here. Uh, we have actually come up with three different subdivisions that the county needs to adopt and take in. Uh, for county maintenance. Uh, these are an oversight, I believe, from past administrations. Uh, we've had uh, incidents where people are needing work done on these particular subdivisions, and we have researched it back, and the letters have been accepted or called, and I guess you want me to do them separately? There's three uh, yeah. of them. Okay, yeah. the first one is Wilshire Walk Subdivision which includes Wilshire Way, Fireside Drive, Watercrest Court. Uh, the bomb was released to the county on September of 2009. Uh, Judd, should we do these separately or can we just do them all together? The three different subdivisions? You can do them all together. All together, okay. okay. Uh, the second subdivision, subdivision will be Hideaway Farms, which includes Hideaway Ridge, Cross Ridge Trail, 
and that bomb was released in October of 2009. And the third one is Oak Ridge Subdivision, which includes Plantation Drive. Um, the bomb for this street was released in 2013, but was not taken into county maintenance. So all three of those are just oversights uh, where they never was accepted. And I'm asking the court today if they will accept those three subdivisions into county maintenance. Scott, I've been out there on Wilshire uh, Way, and uh, it looks like it's up to uh, standards for the county to take over. I'm sure you and Willie have checked also, and so uh, I'm okay with Wilshire Way. I'm not sure about the others out there in Thomas District. And they're all right, too. So do you need a motion, Judge? Yeah, I need a motion to accept these roads into our county maintenance plan. I move we accept these three subdivisions in the county maintenance. Second. Uh, any more discussion? If not, call the roll. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Barker? Yes. Justice. Yes. Thanks, guys. Scott, uh, next is a uh, road department approved approve purchase of a used vehicle. Uh, basically, what we've done, we had budgeted to buy a new pickup truck this year, but as Mr. Tudor knows and a couple of others, uh, our bucket truck has uh, seen its better days. Uh, we're having a lot of problems out of it. Uh, it's a safety issue. And we are wanting to purchase a used bucket truck and use the money that we've budgeted for the new truck. Uh, so basically what I'm doing uh, today is asking the court's permission for me to be able to purchase a used bucket truck uh, for the amount up to $32,000. I guess the people don't know what a bucket truck costs. What would a new one cost? A uh, new one's about 170000 Okay. Uh, a lot of the used ones we looked at, uh, you know, we're finding a few around the 30000 mark, 30 to 35. Uh, most of them, we can probably buy somewhere around a 2010, 2011 model uh, for the 30 to 32. What kind of uh, number of hours or how many miles or what, how do you rate those? Uh, the things? mileage I'm finding uh, for the price we can afford is about 60,000 miles. Uh, the hours are different because a lot of those trucks are, are sitting idle while they're being used. Uh, but we need a minimum of a 60 to 65 foot boom reach. Uh, a lot of the county trees are older trees and that's the only thing that will get the job done. And of course they have to have, um, they have, to have hydraulics on each end to be able to support that size of the lift. So you have to get into a pretty heavy duty truck. And they come with, you're looking at ones that have all the necessary equipment on them. Right? Absolutely, it will be equipped and, and ready to use. <clears throat> is this for um, by auction or is this ones that you've already seen? Well, some of them are ones I have seen online and we have got an opportunity that we could possibly go to an auction uh, from a Duke Power Company I'm sure everybody's familiar with them. They lease their trucks and turn them in every so many years, and they are an option coming up uh, to where we may be able to purchase one of those, and it may be at a cheaper rate. We don't know. It, you know, being an option, you never know what something will bring. We'll have to put a bid out. We, we, ha we have, yeah, we have yeah, we, we have put out a bid too, just to follow the procurement uh, rules. Um, actually, Francie, you've already put it out in the paper. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, we're following all the, the, the procurement rules there, so. Yeah. Trying, to, trying to. Yeah. Judge, I move we give uh, Scott the ability to look into purchasing a bucket truck uh, at the price of $32,000. Up to. Up to $32,000. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Second. There's no more discussion. Call the roll, please. Master Tudor? Yes. Master Bakken? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Judge Taylor? Yes. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Next is agreement uh, with the Des Detention Center of Medical. Uh, this is, uh, obviously you all can remember back, what, the three months ago, we, we had some uh, uh, increase in prices with Southern Health Partners, and so we were gonna look into um, maybe seeing if there was other opportunities for bidders um, to bid on that for us. Uh, during that time, we've not been able to find anybody. Uh, we did extend Southern Health Partners to the end of this month. Um, while we were researching it. You know, we have not been able to find anyone. In the meantime, Southern Health Partners uh, has actually lowered their price um, uh, by about $36,000. 
um, from what we had agreed on before for the extension. Uh, <clears throat> this will be an amendment to amendment number three uh, to the original amendment from back in 2014. Uh, the current contract price uh, was 39000 I'm sorry, $391,817.16 annually. That's about $32,651.43 per month. Uh, they've lowered that um, by $36,560.16 annually, uh, which, is a, which is a decrease uh, in our monthly payment of $29,604.75. Um, so our new annual yearly contract will be $355,257. Um, but this amendment um, only goes through June 30th. Uh, in June, this is always basically six months just to keep uh, the contracts in on a fiscal year. Let me say that uh, the reason it's lowered, <coughs> we went to 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and that's where the pricing came up. Well, some new people came in to, uh, with, with the health department actually came over and, and seen where we were at. And with, let me just say better nursing. They, they figured we could do it with 12 hours a day. So, that, so we're going to have it 12 hours a day, seven days a week. Okay. So after reassessing the time that they would need to be there, uh, we got a reduction in the cost. Yeah, and I, you know, I, I went out to Advanced Correctional Healthcare and talked with them about uh, bidding. Did this also, and they came in like around six hundred something thousand. But they've done it for twenty four seven. He, he figured that's what we would need. The Southern Health Partners here twenty hours a day. Right. So Advanced Correctional did come in with one hundred fifty two hundred thousand dollars more. Doug, do you think the twelve hours a day is, is working fine? Well, again, I, you know, depends on who you get working for you. The nurse. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, and uh, right now with uh, 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 Paula, she is retired from the Department of Corrections. Uh, she was assistant director, uh, um, or assistant deputy commissioner. So she retired from the Department of Corrections, actually with Southern Health Partners now. So she came in and looked at it, and, and again, with the right nursing, right people, you can do a lot more, a lot less. You know, so she figures we can, and it's working right now. And, and typically before this last little bit, it always has been 12 hours, right? Always has been. Yeah. But again, they, yeah. yeah, accountability, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right, good. Good, good, good. If y'all agree with this uh, extension um, for the next six months, Amendment 3 to the Southern Health Partners contract, I need a motion and a second to approve and allow me to sign. Make that motion. Second, man. So we have a motion and a second. Do we have any other discussion? Yes, I'd just like to say, Doug, I, I'm glad that our partners are willing to work with you over there. Mm -hmm. uh, 36,000, I mean, it didn't seem like a giant amount in the, in the terms of your budget, but $36,500, that's a month's worth of inmates out somewhere else in Casey County. So that's, uh, that's good. Yeah, it is good. We appreciate the help very much. But we have to have them in our facility now. We have to have them. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Kenny, if you will, call the roll. Master Botkin? Yes. Master Barger? Yes. Master Tudor? Yes. Just yes. Uh, next is a discussion. Doug wanted to uh, to come in front of the court to talk about the cent detention center building and drainage issues. We've got some issues. Okay. Uh, we've had some issues for a while with, with uh, the sewer system underneath the jail. Um, I've been, and what we do, the, the and, I, and I'm going to let the, Mr. Reuter is here with us. And I had him, he actually came in a couple weeks ago and done some work uh, where we've had some, some drains collapsing. And uh, so I brought gentlemen, these gentlemen in to come up and to tell you what they've done for me. And, and through the years we've had bluegrass there and I mean through the 90s and early 2000s with, with plumbing issues and things like that. So I brought them in, these guys in, so they can tell you more about it than I can. The plumbing is something I don't do. So gentlemen, <laughs> This is with Mr. Reuter, and uh, Don Angie here can talk to you all. Tell you what, what we got going on. I'm Don Fitzpatrick. I'm the project manager at Mr. Reuter. This is David Napier. He's their master plumber. We have spent some extensive time over the years in the jail working on the drains. And it came up here about a month ago. I've, I've looked at the main lines quite extensively over the years in there, and I've known that they're kind of settling over the years, and that they're getting a backfall situation. 
but when we got into this situation with the one particular sale that had backed up, we got into the sale pipes that I hadn't really looked at that close. But we ended up, we had to cut out a section of the floor on that specific pipe and remove some towels out of it. Nothing is wanting to pass through this old cast iron. The inside of it's 30 years old. It's had 30 years of drain cleaner and everything else going down and just wear. The bottom has gone out of it a lot, so it's hanging up stuff. But our biggest issue that complicates it so much is the whole system is, is really getting into a backfall situation now where the building is settling. And the only way that I can attack that and correct that is you've got to start at the beginning of the system and lift the whole thing up. And that, that involves bringing the main lines up and then each individual drain that's attached to each individual cell has to be lifted to get that positive flow to go out of the jail. Right now, the pipes in the jail are sitting somewhere between half and three quarters full of solids and water that's not being pushed out. They're all just gathering in that water. The water keeps on moving, but the solids are stopping. So they're getting occurrences now almost on a daily basis of, of clogged and when we get into a situation like we were in last week, I made a repair on that pipe, but it's it's kind of throwing the money away to repair it because now it has it still has to be busted up and lifted and dealt with. So if I keep going in as an emergency basis and repairing these pipes, I'm not I'm not really fixing them because they still have to be lifted, and to do that it requires. Quite a, quite a mess. Are all the uh, lines that run off the main line, are they okay? No. They're no, not either. All the lines that come into the main line that carry the waste out are all rotten. <clears throat> uh, the one that we did dig up, we had to keep going and going and going before I found enough of a pipe to clamp onto and put a patch in. So they're, the individual cells are, are pretty much rotted. And then the mains that carry everything out is falling backwards. So it's, it's not carrying anything out. What's your suggestion? At this point, we do have a plan to fix it. Uh, we get into this quite a bit. We just have to start in the, the back of the jail where the system begins and start lifting everything, replace it with PVC, get rid of the cast iron, and go in sections at a time. It's going to be very complicated because of inmate traffic and moving meals around and everything else. But this system is so complex to get into all these things. I mean, they put these pipes in and then built a jail on top of it. So we have to figure out as a company how to get in there, you know, the less intrusive manner that I can do remove those pipes, raise them up and put new in, get them inspected by the state, put concrete on and get his people back in. So it's it's a very complicated system. We can fix it, but it's gonna take probably, I figure eight, nine weeks to do this in sections and Doug's cooperation and getting people out and getting people moved and put here and there while it's going on. So it's, it's, a, it's a big deal that's, that has to be done over there, or, or you're just going to keep repairing a system, spending a lot of money to repair a system just to have to jackhammer it up and fix it. So you're kind of throwing good money after bad to make emergency repairs. So. The um, uh, as far as the settling of those pipes. Uh, I mean, you would bring in some type of field to raise them back up and make sure that those are compacted to where they're not going to continue to settle? Yes. I mean, it's, it's hard for me to believe that after 30 years, things are still settling. Well, then, um, I, I, And so it could be some of the pipes are broke, and so water is sort yeah. of washing away yeah. some, of the, some of the field materials and cause it to be softer. A lot of the <clears> pipe, <throat> the bottom is the first thing to go in cast iron. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the pipes is just kind of seeping out over the years, you know, underneath the, the concrete. Right. So we do have a plan to, to put fill under that 
and, and get as much grillage as we can to support it. Uh, we have that in our, in our plan to, to fix it. Is there any other methods uh, that, that uh, seems like that there's some new methods in some, in some uh, sanitary sewer uh, under streets and stuff where they mm -hmm. potentially can go in there and they have some type of product that kind of balloons out mm -hmm. and sort of coats the inside of those pipes? Yeah, we have that technology. Uh, my issue with that, the only time that we can't do that is is when there's a backfall situation. What the yeah, state comes yeah. in when they come in and inspect it to approve it, we have to run a camera through it for the inspector. And when if he sees any water in it, it's failed. So if I line what's existing there, I'm lining it with a backfall situation. And it's, yeah. It's going to hold water. So you think the backfall is from the very back of the building or wherever it goes out of the building all the way to the front? It is. It, it's so all it, the way to the manholes. Okay. Holes. okay. So it's, yeah. I've looked at it every way I can over the last few months to correct it without having to come in and cut floors and jackhammer, and there's just no other way. Uh, we have pipe bursting technology. We have pipe liner technology. But each of those, again, will fall under the inspection of where it would, it would be failed because it's holding water. It just <coughs> follows what's already there. Now, there may be a couple of the cells I can do, you know, with the liner. But overall, the majority of this will have to be cut, jackhammered, removed, and then everything put back with, with new pipe. Mm -hmm. And it's... Is there any kind of estimated cost? My best guess. I mean, is well, this and, and bef before you actually give that number, because it's probably unfair to you, you throwing out an estimated right, number. Right. Just for you all to know, anything over twenty thousand dollars has to be bid. It's well over that. Um, and so, uh, so just so you all know that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah aware we're of that. aware of it. Yeah. Um, and that's that's fine. I just have we personally have spent so much time in in the jail looking at these pipes and cleaning them and correcting things, I know that system very well. And I just wanted to relate to you. Yeah, I had it come up because I know nothing about it. Again, Anthony here has done it through the years with Ronnie and, and myself. And, 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 and I, again, I just had him come up to, to explain where we're at. We've actually, uh, Robert, um, a maintenance officer, he, he's actually, we've actually dug up some showers and, and jack air them out and, and replaced the piping you know, ourselves too. Through, through the years, not long ago. So, but I had him come up to explain, because again, I know nothing about plumbing. So that's the reason I had that. I come assume up. with the uh, lines being bad, can you consider some kind of pump system that would push the water? I mean, any, anything like that would be probably just as intrusive as as getting in there and actually correcting it and, yeah. and making it right again. Mm -hmm. Once you do this and, and fix it, you'll probably have many years where. Mm -hmm you'll not have any issues other than normal clogs then. So and we're going to have clogs then because that's what inmates do. Yeah. They'll flush your towel, they'll flush a sheet, they'll flush yeah, a blanket. They do whatever they do. This is what they do. This is what they do just to cause us problems and issues, to tear something up. So are you having your major problem in the main lines or the side lines also? It's, it's both. Uh, once, once, the, once the product makes it out of the side lines and gets the main line, it has an uphill battle to fight its way to the manhole. You know, someone will flush back here and push it a little bit, the water will run out. And a lot of the solids just, just stay in that pipe. You know, eventually they'll work their, their way down or they'll clog up. And are these six to eight inch mains? These are four inch mains. Four inch is four all inch, they are in that building? Four inch mm -hmm. cast iron. Wow. Judge, would the insurance? I got a four inch mines. Insurance cover any of that? Huh? Would the any kind of insurance cover? I don't know. It's the first I've heard of it, John. We'd have to, I mean, there's going to have to be some looking think, into it. I have, I have a lot of, of homeowners that get coverage like that. A lot of the insurance companies, and I don't know who you have, but a lot of our experience with, with their homeowner's insurance, they'll cover the jackhammering, the remo removing, and the putback. They just don't pay for the pipe or the labor to glue the pipe together. It's definitely something to, to pursue and look in. Well, that sounds like about half the cost, isn't it? Mm, it's, it's about three quarters of the charge. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah we need to get you know, all the help we can on something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, he, he didn't need to give an estimate until we know whether we got to bid it or not. Yeah. Well, I mean, it doesn't have to be that they're going to do it, but just give them an idea of what kind of work, what kind of scope. I mean, the scope of work that needs to be done. Okay. Not who's going to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. All right. Any, any other questions, guys? All right, appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Appreciate y'all coming in. Uh, next is a Battlefield Golf Promotion. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. I'm here to get your approval to promote Jordan Freeman uh, from the interim <coughs> lead golf shop attendant to the permanent golf shop attendant, and that would be effective tomorrow, January 10th. He's been with us about five years, started seasonal, and it's been about a year and a half that he's been full time. Normally I would bring him in here so you can see him, but being the winter, he and I are the only ones staffing the golf course, so he's back to the golf course. And it would be at $9 an hour following the uh, standard classifications for that position. Make a motion that we promote uh, Jordan Freeman. Second, Bill. That's from eight fifty to nine dollars, Gary. Is that yes. Right? No more discussion. Call the roll. Master Barger. Yes. Master Tudor. Yes. Master Buck. Yes. 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 Thank Thanks, you. Gary. Appreciate it. Uh, next, the judges report. Uh, a few announcements that I'd like to make. The Martin Luther King Unity Breakfast will be held on nine, at nine a.m. on Monday, January fifteenth, at the First Methodist Church in Richmond with the march to be held at 11 a.m. for anybody that would like to go. Uh, the Richmond Chamber of Commerce uh, 2018 kickoff will be Monday, January 15th from 5 to 7 p.m. Uh, please contact the Richmond Chamber of Commerce for more details. Uh, there will be a blood drive on Tuesday, January 16th from 11 to 5 at the Fellowship Hall of the Union Church uh, here in Berea on Prospect Street. Uh, Madison County welcomes the Kentucky All-A Basketball Classic on Wednesday, January the 24th through Sunday, January 28th uh, at EKU's <laughs> Alumni Coliseum. <clears throat> um, it is great to have that uh, tournament back in Madison County in Richmond. Uh, I know it brings a lot of uh, opportunity. People get to see our community. Uh, brings a lot of tax dollars into our community over that weekend. Uh, it will be very busy on the EKU bypass during that tournament. Uh, it does bring in a lot of people. Uh, Madison County Library is beginning a new set of free GED courses. Uh, if you're interested in getting your GED, please call 622-8065 or 623-6704 um, for class schedules and more information. Uh, the Madison County Courthouse and its related offices will be closed Monday, January 15th. That's this coming Monday uh, for Martin Luther King holiday. Offices will reopen on Tuesday, January 16th uh, at 8 a.m. That's all I've got. Uh, co comments from department heads? Nobody? Comments from masters? Raj? Uh, no have much, just uh, hope everybody's getting started off in the new year on the right foot. The weather's been a little tough on us. So appreciate all the county workers stepping out and we're doing the move to the other building and that's a little complicated too but it's been going pretty good. I haven't heard any complaints there yet. I uh, just want to thank everybody for uh, uh, what they uh, supported us for in the past year and we've still got a tough year to go here as far as making some big decisions just like this sewer thing. You know, there's always something coming up but we have to investigate before we can make a decision because it's big money that sometimes we don't have and got to figure out how, how we're going to do it. But, uh, just appreciate everybody's help. Thanks, Raj. John? Uh, Judge Colleen, along with uh, Master Bodkin and myself, toured the, uh, the rehab, a couple of rehab centers in eastern Kentucky this week and, and uh, a couple of them that we're trying to use as models for what, what we're going to try to work to do and, and uh, uh, we were really impressed with uh, some progress they were having uh, up there and uh, it, with the 30 and, and even the 90 day programs they're, they're working through up there and, and so it's it's some, it's a uh, progress 
to try and get through all this and get the right ideas and get the right set before we make a commitment on yeah. this. But I think we're moving in the right direction on this, and, and uh, we're going to uh, make some decisions here fairly soon. Yeah. Uh, just that, uh, like Roger said, there's been a lot of snow and ice lately, and it seems to hit uh, basically on the weekends. So uh, uh, our road crews are out there. Willie is on call at all times. He has his crews on call. As soon as he finds out there's a situation that needs some uh, uh, salt or, or grading or whatever, it seemed like we had a snow on the north side of the county this past snow, and, and uh, the one before was on the south end of the county. So it's it's hitting in spots, and not, not all the counties affected at once. So use caution when you're going from one end of the county to the other. You might not have the same road condition. This kind of weather, you never know what to expect with the freezing temperatures. Yep. So just be careful and slow down. Uh, if you need to reach me, it's 661 -0044. Thanks, John. I'm going to add a little bit uh, real quick to that. Um, and just all those that are listening um, to this meeting, every snow event is not the same. Uh, and so a lot of times uh, constituents that maybe have a slick road, they think it's just the same snow event and that the road department salted the last time. Or, um, and so every snow event's a little different, and it puts uh, our road department, our guys, in dangerous positions a lot of times, uh, depending on, on what that event is. For instance, uh, this last little skiff we had just a couple days ago, it was ice, a little thin layer of ice. Um, and some of our rural areas, we just cannot put our employees and our equipment in a position where somebody could get hurt. Um, and so we just want y'all to be understanding of, of different snow events. Um, when, when, when it's unsafe for our guys to go over a hill uh, where there's huge drop-offs and we're slipping and sliding, you know, just be patient with us. We, we know it's not that we're not trying to provide that service to you, but it's just a dangerous situation. So um, please be patient. Please be understanding. Um, our guys do an excellent job. Um, but sometimes these ice events are tougher uh, to scrape roads and to clear pathways more so than a 12-inch snow. Um, so please be patient. Sorry, Tom, I didn't mean to take any of your well, time. But. Just to add to that, um, I've had several comments from folks that I run into about the uh, scraping up ice or, and also, well, why is school called off today? You know, it's, it's, it looks like roads are in great shape. Well. <laughs> If you've never been, you should take a trip out to Pusey Ridge sometime. Because I can tell you now, it takes a pretty good nerve to drive a dump truck over that hill when the road's dry out there to get down to the boat ramp, let alone if it's got some kind of substance on it, ice, snow, or whatever. So there's a lot of reasons for school to call off and a lot of reasons for our, the safety that you're talking about for our truck drivers. Um, I saw in our uh, purchases there that we had a $15,000 uh, bill for salt, the Detroit Salt Company. Are we restocking? Is that what's going yeah. on out there? And I'm guessing, I, you know, I don't know how much we put down. I know that the first time we talked, we were talking about about a $50,000 uh, event to distribute salt the first time. And sure. the first, you know, the one that hit Bria. That's the one, that's Count Labor. And that's a whole nine yards. That's right. So not only, uh, my point of that is, is not only is it uh, a safety issue, the dollar is not the problem, but you need to bear in mind that when you see them salt trucks rolling out in front of your house throwing out salt, you're talking about $50,000 lick on an easy day. Mm -hmm. You take a deep snow, 20 inches, and you're racking up some money pretty quick out there on that. Of course, that's what you pay taxes for, and that's what we'll keep doing. Um, one thing that I have thought about over the course of time, and I want to direct this to the road department, um, I know that with the issue of snows and the, you know, the, just the, when it comes, it comes. If it comes on Friday, it's a Friday. If it's Saturday or Sunday, it's Saturday or Sunday. But one of the things that I've often wondered about is our workforce down there works Monday through Friday on 410s. And I would just like to to enter the idea of staggering the workforce if it's possible, you know what your workloads are, for a Monday through Thursday and a Tuesday through Friday. 
you know, if you can split them up so that at least on Friday we have a coverage down there. We don't have to call somebody in for overtime. Just an idea. Um, just the last thing I've got is uh, state work is being done this week out on um, 595 Walt Meadow Pike and also out on Barnes Mill, 876. So please be aware of the state trucks as they're out uh, working on culverts and cleaning roadside so that they'll drain better and slow down and give those, chance, uh, those guys a chance to make it home as well. And if you need me, I can be reached at 200 9765. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Judd, do you have anything to do? No. Kenny? No, sir. Sure. No. Doug, you good? I'd like to ask John and sure. Tom, the places you've toured, mm -hmm. what, what length of treatment do they have? You said 30 and 90 days. I think it is there some, is there some long term? No. 30, 60, 90, based on uh, insurance and uh, Medicaid, whether it's private insurance, okay. and depending on what the severity of the, the need was. Yeah. We saw two totally, uh, in my opinion, two totally different type of facilities in that one was a, um, they both treated men and women, but one of the facilities was all sort of on a on site, if you will. You could see, you could stand one end, look at one side to the other side. The other side was more of a home structure and each had their pluses, each had their minuses. I mean, there's good and not necessarily bad, but there's there's good and bad, if you will, in both of them. So it was very interesting. It was very eye-opening. Um, I thought that, that the management's um, approach to both of them were, were a little bit different in that um, one of them was sort of a program. I heard some things at both places that make you scratch your head, and, mm, but, you know, they both have successful programs. So, I mean, it's hard to say. It's going to be a tough decision when it comes down to that. When you say successful, do you mean uh, they graduate, I guess, from that, that area of, of the rehabilitation center? Do we know if they've been, you know, reincarcerated after that or? Uh, you know, Doug, we, it's like every other situation. There's going to be uh, quite a few that rehab, relapse and, and go back. but. You know, they are making a difference. I don't know what the percentage were, but, uh, you know, if, if we make 30% the difference in... Uh, yeah, right, yeah. Yeah. I didn't really get a chance to ask that question at the first facility that we went because we didn't see uh, a group at one time. But at the last facility that we went, we saw a group of ladies that was probably, what does he say, maybe 30 to 50. Yeah, from no. 19 to 44, I think. And we age. got the question and answer uh, to some of those, and we actually asked if some had been there before in that treatment facility before. There was a few of them that raised their hand. So, you know, I guess it's like everything else. To some degree, it's up to the individual whether or not they actually make it. it I think that it's something that we've always had questions about, and that's if, you know, what kind of a environment are they returning to once they leave? Uh, the one promising thing that, that we saw uh, in both of them um, is that they both have the uh, ability to um, not only help them get through a program, but to, in some cases, help them find a job after that. And so and in the last program, they're using a lot of their people that actually graduate their, through their program to be counselors in their own program. So we saw a lot of good things down there. And that's one of the things that in all this drug epidemic, we can't continue to do the same thing we've been doing. I mean, this is all part of this idea is, is that we're not just doing the same thing, a 60, 90 day program. We're adding another component to this that is educational based. Um, it's extending their term um, to where that we're putting, potentially putting people on a successful path um, to choose a career path um, you know, it's very hard to expect somebody at the end of the day to not relapse when they uh, go to a 60, 30, 90 day program, whatever it might be, and then they come out of there with that mental healing, but then they go right back into the same environment they were in. Um, they, the stresses of life, um, paying electric bills, paying, if, they, if, we, don't, if we don't give people <clears throat> the tools they need to be successful, and how do we really expect uh, the majority to rehabilitate themselves, you know? Um, and so, you know, a lot of the things that we're 
uh, that we're looking into is is things that are being done. Uh, what we can't find is is the things that aren't being done. That, that extra phase that we're adding, um, independent living, um, job skills, GED, vocational training, educational components uh, that will put them on a different path than than what they come out of right now. Um, and so, you know, that's one of the things that we talk about a lot. Uh, and and sometimes you you know people might not believe 100% in the rehabilitation portion of it, the rehab portion of it, um, but they're looking at what's being done now. We're 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 a actually wanting to add a different little spin to it to see if it's more more successful. I, I think we've seen in the past that you know a lot of people go through the detox portion of 30 days and get dried out, and then they're turned right back in the same environment. A lot of these girls we talked to up in, in uh, was Kate, or I didn't know, uh, Louisa, said that, you know, chances are they didn't want to go back in the same environment they come from because they knew they would relapse and be right, right back in the same situation. They wanted some help to get some education. They want some help to get some job placement and better their lives in that way and, and not just uh, 30 days and, and then right back out in the same environment that they were used to. And it, it's a probably a two year plus ongoing process that those people need help and guidance to follow the, through it and get their lives back on track. Uh, uh, this this is a happened this past week. Uh, uh, it's a cousin of mine. Been clean and sober for six years. Six years. Uh, there's, there's no guarantee and, on any of it, no. And just checked himself in Wednesday after six years of sobriety, just checked himself in on Wednesday. Now, I'm tickled to death, but he went through a treatment program a, six years ago uh, and fell off the wagon. And, the, and, and to me, the positive side of this is, is that he checked himself in. Um, that, that what he learned when he went to rehab six years ago and being living a six-year sober life, um, he took it upon himself to realize, hey, I'm falling off the wagon here. I need to get help before I go and do something. So, um, you know, this is evil. Man, this drug stuff is evil. Uh, nobody can disagree with that. Um, but I'll say it till I'm blue in the face. Uh, what we're doing right now to combat this drug epidemic, it's not working. Um, and it is winning, it is winning the war. Uh, arresting, uh, Doug's numbers continue to climb, court numbers continue to climb in indictments and cases. Um, and, and I'm sorry, but arresting and incarcerating uh, is, not, is not working. Um, and so, you know, uh, we want to continue to try to think outside the box and try to come up with a solution that gives us better numbers than what we've got right now. I think so. also that, you know, Doug's sitting there with close to 400 incarcerated over there. He's going to have to have some help and some more room uh, to work those people through that system also. So he, he can't continue overcrowding like that. He's, he's got to have some help over there in the jail. To be continued. Right, Doug? Exactly. You know, I'm, I'm all for helping. But I just don't think that's our solution. Our answer is just rehab. I just don't think that's the total answer. No, it, it's what just is, a what small is it? What is the answer? Again, we all vote none of us. I just don't think that's our total. I mean, that's our answer. You know, I'm all for helping also, but I know, and I think we all know that it's our deal with the crowd and it's going to be because we're growing as a county, too. But we have, I don't think we have is our only answer. You know what I mean? Yeah. Gotcha. Are people saying that's the only answer? <coughs> Yeah, I think it's a collaboration of things, man. I think we got to do multiple things to really win this. You know, it's not just a rehab. It's not just a, a new jail. It's not, um, uh, I, think, I think it's a collaboration of things. It's not a one shoe fits all. 
Um, and, you know, looking back on it and looking at statistics, I mean, technically we should have added on that jail at least eight years ago. You know, I mean, the numbers, when you showed the numbers of the increase in population, I mean, it goes well back before this court was here. Um, and argu arguably, I guess, uh, before you were jailer, Doug, I mean, you didn't come in with it uh, under capacity, I don't think, when I look back at the numbers. I think we came in around, I think I was around 220. Yep, that's what I was thinking, yep. So, I mean, at that time, what was that, 10? 2010? So, I mean, you were already over uh, capacity then. So. Doug, you know the old adage, uh, pound of prevention is worth, or ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure? Uh, you know, it, that goes back to the basic, we need to, some prevention here too, and try to uh, stop some of this before they get hooked on these yeah. drugs and get addicted. Oh, I totally so, so I, I think we're gonna have to push some more programs in our school system than even at home and their churches and everywhere. Every citizen is responsible to do what they can to help prevent this drug epidemic. You know, one other thing, just to follow up with what you were saying, and I, I give you the both spec, both ends of the spectrum there. Doug. We saw, we also got to go to a pregnancy uh, center as well, a treatment facility. And one of the ladies in the facility was there and told us that it was her 10th child and that she, and I quote, I hope I get to keep this one. Well, I want to tell you something, that, that was scary. But sitting right beside her was a 19 year old and what I saw on her face as, as she was due at any given day was I saw hope on her face. I saw one and, and she, she hopes that, she said, you know, she didn't, she was an addict and got, got pregnant. So, you know, she, but what I saw on her face and a lot of them there was I saw hope on her face. They, they can see a way out of it without being perpetual user forever. That's what I saw. Uh, through the rehab programs, I, I, I really believe that a vocational aspect to it is, is, is the biggest thing. If you can put it, if you can show them that they can do a job or show them how to do a job and feel better about themselves, they'll be more apt to go out and try to get a job instead of going out and trying to just say, you know, there's, there's nothing out here for me. Uh, and and I've, I've told you all this example, but this is one, but if you, if you, if you get one out of a hundred, you're probably flying, I guess, I don't know, but we had a gentleman that worked for us at the ferry to the jail. Uh, his time was up, he got out, uh, sent word back, and this, it took him like nine months to do this, and that's pretty quick for what he done, but he got a, from that training there and the hours he got, he was able to go work on a barge in Cincinnati. Nine months later, he's over a crew of 18 or 20 men on one of those barges. It, it made a difference in his life just because he was on that ferry getting some kind of training. Before, he was just gonna be let out and Doug's looking for him back in two or three months. So every one of them is not gonna do that. I mean, we'd be lucky, like I said, to get one out of 100, but that's, that's why we're here. They, they have to regain their worth and their self-esteem right. Feel like they're making the okay. difference. And, and if they don't get that training while they're in rehab, they're not going to get outside. We didn't get to see a, a men's facility, but um, the, at the last place that we were at, they told us the uh, proprietor there told us that they had signed a contract that week before um, with a company to teach vocational skills to their men. Just to add welding, I think it was. Yeah, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. welding. Yes, welding to their men. So I'll just to add to you what you're just saying. Thanks, guys. Good conversation. Um, uh, appreciate it. We've got a lot of uh, challenges that we're facing in the future, and uh, that's what we're here for. We're here to figure out what's best for our community and best for the citizens and the lives of our county. So I uh, appreciate everybody's comments and due diligence. Uh, next on the agenda is to pay the claims and approve the transfers. I need a motion and a second to do so. So moved. Second. No discussion. Call the roll, please. Mr. Barter? Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Tudor? Yes. Mr. Bakken? Yes. Just Taylor? Yes. Uh, next court date is Tuesday, January the 23rd, 2017 in Richmond. Uh, again, it's uh, Tuesday, January 23rd, 
Move do not put 17 in the paper. Uh, January 23rd, 2018 in Richmond. Move to adjourn. <laughs> Second. Hey. Call the roll, please. Mr. Tudor? Yes. Mr. Barger? Yes. Mr. Botkin? Yes. Mr. Tudor? Yes. Thanks, guys. Appreciate everybody being here.